We are continuing with our series here with these, these basic foundational elements of Harmony Community Church. The first one was Discover. We talked about that two weeks ago. Worship this week is Grow. And I, again, I hope you're kind of seeing that these things are all connected. You can't serve without growing. You can't grow without worship. And you certainly can't worship a God you have not discovered. So we are in the point now where these messages are really shifting over a little bit. And they are about exclusively focused on, and this message is exclusively, exclusively focused on people who are saved, people who are our believers. I don't want you to hear this list I'm getting ready to read and think, oh, this is a list I can do in order to get God to love me. If I go and do all these things, I'll be okay. No, no, these are things that happen after we become a believer. In fact, none of this stuff is going to matter to any person sitting in here or anybody who's listened to it who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'll tell you up front, it doesn't work. It's not what it's designed to do. But there is some interesting, ever since, of all the things that Jesus could have used, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, one of my absolute favorite conversations in the entire Bible. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. In order for you to be saved, you have to be born again. And Jesus knew exactly what Nicodemus was going to do. He was a thinker. He was a theologian. He knew he was going to banter words back and forth. How ah, can I go in my mother's womb and be born a second time? It's interesting, isn't it, that that's the analogy he chose to use. That our salvation, our coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior, if that has happened for you, is a rebirth. How extraordinary was it that, that Peter read that passage? We are a new creation. We are born again, born anew. And it is, little, it is a literal birth process because we are then no longer the same person that we were before that. We are, in the words that Peter read just a second ago, we are what? A new creation, not an improvement over the last creation. We are a new creation. We are literally born again. I'm going to read three passages for you, and I want you to hear the theme that is coming from each one of these. The first one's going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. So put away, this is not the passage we're going to focus on. We'll get into that in just a second. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Our next passage is going to be 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not ready for it. And then lastly, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principle of the or principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Do you see the theme in all of these passages? The first one we read said, as an infant in Christ, when you become newborn, you, need, you desire that milk. That's what you're supposed to have. It's the thing that's going to help you grow. In the second one, he said, well, I'm still giving you milk, but there's more out there. You shouldn't stay there. There's no, you shouldn't desire to stay in this milk stage. You're supposed to eat solid food. You're not quite there. And in the last one, what is he saying? You guys should be munching on steak right now, but instead you're still drinking milk. If we are so sure in our physical lives, using the analogy of the baby that I used earlier, if we are so sure and so quick to understand that a baby that stays the same length and the same width Length, uh, wait at six months and we immediately know there's something wrong why don't we do the same thing with us from a spiritual standpoint if we do not grow in Christ it's the same as growing physically there is 
something wrong. And it could be significantly wrong. Growth is expected. God doesn't tell us, go out and grow. You need to go out and grow. You, you can tell in each one of those things. The growth is expected, just like we expect physical growth in all of us. It's not something you go out and do. It's something that God does through you. We should have the immediate desire to grow as soon as we come to faith in Him. But what does that look like? I'm so glad you asked. Because the passage we're going to look at this morning is going to tell us exactly what that growth looks like. If the, and I'm not talking about, look, look here's what, the way it was explained to me years ago. I thought it was a great illustration, and so I've, I've continued to use it. So you become a believer, and you start that process of growing, right? Every now and then, we level off. We don't need to grow, but we don't do this. Right? There's, no, there's no down, it's just we may level off, and we may level off for a long time. But the idea is that we, we grow some more, and then we may level off again. But the overall trajectory is one of growth. If we do not see that growth, if we do not experience that growth, if we cannot quantify that growth, and I do believe it is quantifiable, then like any other growth that doesn't happen, it is a problem. You don't have to tell a plant to grow. It just does it. You don't have to tell a kid to grow. They just do it. You don't have to tell us to grow. We just do it. And if not, there's a problem. So what we're going to do here, we're going to look at these passages in 2 Peter. Look at these verses in 2 Peter. And we're going to look at what the elements of growth are. These are the kind of things we should be looking for. This is not a to-do list. This is a reflection list. Is this actually happening? Is this happening to me? Not that it happens all the time. I get that. Please, I don't want to burden you. This is not a burden message. I don't want to burden you and say, oh gosh, now i got to go out and do all of this stuff. That's not what this is about. This is a reflection to be able to see, yes, I do see this in my life. Even if it's just that much, it's still growth. But I want to see more of it. And I want to do more of it. And, you, and a lot of these things, that's what the implication is. It will show us exactly how that ends up happening. So hold on, give me a second. Talk amongst yourselves because if I don't... Uh, I don't put this thing on here. We'll be in here for like seven or eight hours. Okay, there we go. And we don't want that to happen. So the verse we're, verses we're going to be looking at are in 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, oh, I know, I know I said I was going to read it, but let me stop right there. This is, he said in the stage, this is for believers. I'm, all this stuff that's getting ready to come after this only applies if you belong to God. That's the only way we can have His righteousness in the first place. So he's making us very clear who the audience is here. The audience is those who have come to faith in Christ because he knows this stuff can only happen to people who have come to faith in Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus. Verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How cool is that? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He's granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. We could spend a month of Sundays on that phrase alone. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And here we go, beginning in verse 5, where he's going to list these ingredients of growth. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that not only do you save us when you draw us to you, when you show us the mercy and the grace by, by granting us salvation, not only do you save us for the time to come, for the, for the time after we end our lives on this planet, Lord, but you give us the ability to grow in you, 
to become literally more like you while we are on this planet. That should be the driving desire of every single believer on this planet, to be more like you. We don't always know how that works, Lord. We don't always know what it looks like, but we here have your word that shows us the things that would be present in our lives if we are growing. And we desperately want, we, Lord, if, if, if there's anybody here who does not have the desire to grow in you, that you would, you would do that today, that you would instill in every one of us the desire to grow, to know you more today than I did yesterday and tomorrow than the before the day after that. I know as I could live to be a thousand, Lord, and I'll still never know and understand everything about you on this planet, this side of heaven, but I can know more, and I can know more because of you. And you give us that, Lord. We, that's part of your grace. It's part of your salvation. You give us the ability, the understanding, the power to live more like you, to be more like you because your righteousness has been placed on us. And so I pray, Father God, that we would not misunderstand this message in any way, shape, or form, that we would not be burdened by it, but that we would be awakened by it to be able to see who you are and who we are in you. That is the only way we can know us is to know you. So I pray you have free reign in this place this morning. I lift you up and glorify you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so let's go. We got, we got quite a few things, and we're just going to hit the wave tops here. So, so we're going to kind of give you an overview here of what these ingredients of growth actually look like. And the first one we see in the first part of verse 5 is intent. There has to be intent. Growth does not happen by osmosis. I wish it did. I really do. I really wish I didn't have to do anything. For this very reason, make every effort. Growth is an intentional thing. It's not a byproduct. It's not a, I kind of hope it happens. There is an intent in there. I want to grow. I want to know him better than I did before. I want to be more like him than I was before. If that intent is not there, I will tell you, it's interesting that he starts out this way. That's a, that's a huge problem. It's a big, giant problem. He is presupposing here that this is the way that we're going to feel. This is the way we're going to do things. This isn't, no, go out and have intent. He said, if you belong to me, you will have the intent. You will want this. You will desire this. Now, whether we do anything about it, well, we'll get to that. That's coming up. But if we don't even have the intent, that is a gigantic issue. The desire to do what he wants us to do should be almost immediate after our salvation. In Luke chapter 19, we see Jesus interacting with an interesting guy named Zacchaeus. In chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he, is, he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's an extraordinary event, one that we're all very familiar with. Did you know that the law in the Old Testament actually covered this kind of crime that Zacchaeus had committed? It's in the Old Testament. If you deceive somebody to get something, if you steal something from them, if you defraud them, you need to pay back the amount that you defrauded from them, and you also need to pay back one-fifth of the value for restitution. That's what the law said, one-fifth of the value. Did Zacchaeus do that? Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give back fourfold what I took from people, not the one-fifth that is actually required of me. Then Jesus says something interesting, doesn't he? He says, today salvation has come to this house. Now, he didn't say that because Zacchaeus gave fourfold. Zacchaeus gave fourfold because he became a believer. That's the point. That's how Jesus knew and recognized and understood 
It was because he had the immediate intent and desire to be the person God had called him to be. He did not want to be the same Zacchaeus. He didn't want to be. And he didn't want to just do what was required of him. He wanted to do so much more than that. The intent almost immediately when he became a new creation and he understood what he had done, that he wanted to be more like God. That's that intent that we're talking about. It was the desire. You can hear it dripping from his words. And if you're there, I'm sure you could have seen it on his face. So first we have to have intent. Number two, virtue. He mentions that for, every re- for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. What is meant by that word? It is defined as, in a moral sense, what gives a person his or her worth. As a believer, what gives us our worth? It is not us. It is not the things that we do. As a believer, we find our value in one person and one person only, and that is in God. We are called as part of our growth to grow in our virtue, to be a virtuous person. Do you know what God's standard for us is as far as virtue is concerned? If you don't know, I can certainly tell you because he makes it abundantly clear. And it is one of the most disheartening verses in all of Scripture, if you want it to be that way. But he tells us very clearly in Matthew's Gospel, Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the standard that we have to ascribe to is perfect. Utter and complete perfection. We all hosed that up on the way to church this morning. Did we not? Every single one of us messed that up on the way to church. We said, thought, or did something that was the exact opposite of what God wants from us. If His standard is perfection and we're supposed to grow in our virtue, it can only be because His virtue is placed on us. Us, his righteousness is placed on us. I am a righteous person. You know how hard it is for those words to come out of my mouth, by the way? I am a righteous person, and it is not because of one single thing I have ever done in my entire life. In fact, the bulk of my life has probably been doing more wrong things than right things in in, in either word, thought, or deed. I am righteous. I stand before you today as a righteous person because of the blood of Jesus. Because of His righteousness. That's what happens when we come to faith in Him. Does that mean I don't do anything? No, I still do things wrong. But I am covered with His righteousness according to Romans chapter 3. So that when He sees me, He sees His virtue, not mine. I can't be perfect, but He can. So He dwells within me. He covers me with His righteousness. Ipso facto, I'm perfect. Not indeed but in the state of my being, all because of Him. We are supposed to grow in our virtue. That is supposed to trickle down to our actions. If we are not acting better, if we are not behaving better, that's why I hope you you guys didn't misunderstand if you were here last week. I hope you didn't misunderstand what I meant when I said I I didn't care if you were were going to be a better father or a better husband. I mean, I care in in the general sense. What I care about is you belonging to God. What I care about is you come into faith in Jesus Christ because when that happens, you will be a better father, you will be a better, better husband, a better wife, a better mother. You see what I'm saying? That's what all this virtue is completely His, and we can only grow in that because of Him. Number three, knowledge. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. This is a big one. The book of Hosea tells us My people are destroyed because of sin. Is that what that passage said? No, we are, but that's that's not what that particular passage says. My people perish or my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And I'm not talking about general worldly knowledge like, you know, engineering or, you know, whatever academic things, I'm not talking about that knowledge. When he says knowledge, what knowledge does he mean? Knowledge of him. And how do we get our knowledge from him? There's only one way. 
Yeah, yeah, I heard one person say the Bible. That's extremely disheartening. I hope the rest of you are saying, saying that in your mind. Yes, God's Word, that's the only way we can have more knowledge of Him. And then, even then, when we read it, because it, is it different when I read the Bible and when a non-believer reads the Bible? We're reading the same Bible. We're reading the same words, right? Yeah. Is there a difference between those two readings? Absolutely. I tried reading the Bible before I was a believer. I'm not messing around when I say, it looked, it was complete gibberish to me. Complete gibberish. I didn't understand any of it. Afterwards, I was able to understand it. And every year that goes by and every month that goes by and every day that goes by, I understand it more and more. It, again, doesn't happen by osmosis. Can't put it under your pillow and hope the words seep into your head. If we are not growing in our knowledge of Him, then we are not growing. And you know how you get that knowledge, as I said before, it's God's Word. It's not listening to me. It's not. I'm glad you are. But that's not, if, if, if any of you guys ever say, we're having a conversation with somebody, and you're talking to them about God, and you say God is this way, and they ask you, how do you know that? Well, I heard my pastor say that last week. I, it would crush me if I heard you say that. It would crush me. It says because God's Word said that. Now, do I want to preach God's Word accurately and teach it accurately? Absolutely I do. That's my goal. I don't want to mislead you. Can I be accidentally wrong? It's happened two or three times in my lifetime. Yeah, I could be wrong. Yeah. So I tell you, don't take my word for this stuff. Always, always go back to God's Word. You don't get more knowledge by listening to me. You get more knowledge by reading God's Word. Now, I'm trying to teach you God's Word as best I can. But without that knowledge, we will not grow in any way, shape, or form. 66 books, thousands upon thousands of verses, all designed to do one thing, for us to know Him better. And only the Holy Spirit can allow that to happen in the first place. So again, it goes back to being believers. Okay, that was number three. Number four, self-control. This is an interesting one, isn't it? Verse 6, and knowledge with self-control. The word self-control in the original language means to be in power. That's the idea. Let me ask you something. When you, see, when you hear that term self-control, are you thinking immediately to yourself, boy, that, that self-control stuff, that's really easy. Does anybody think that self-control is easy? I would really like to meet you and chat with you a little bit if you think that self-control is easy because we are continuously, even as believers, battling with our old nature. Old man, new man, old Adam, new Adam. We, we see that goal coming, that, 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 that dichotomy pops up over and over and over and over again. In fact, there's a passage here that I want to read to you really quickly because there's a verse in there, a word in there that um, uh, doesn't translate uh, as, as colorfully as it does in the original language. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Uh, is that the right one? Let's see. Yes. Okay, here's Paul writing to the, uh, the Corinthian church. And listen to what he says here. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest, I, lest after preaching to others I should find myself disqualified. Okay, so he says, I discipline my body. That's a fine translation. Discipline, there's nothing wrong with that translation. It does everything that it's supposed to do. In the original language, do you know what that word literally means? I think I've shared this with you before. It literally means to punch yourself in the face, under the eyes, enough to leave bruising. That's what the word literally means. So when he says, I discipline my body, he's saying, I am pummeling my body every single day. It's a fight against my flesh. So much so that I actually get injured doing it. That's how bad. I, so I think the word discipline is fine, but it misses that kind of connotation, doesn't it? If you don't know what the original word means, that's exactly what it means. Self-control is not easy. The Bible, by the way, never says that it's easy. If Paul thought it was easy, he wouldn't be talking about punching himself in the face. That is a part of our growth. Am I a better person than I was before I was saved? Yes. Do I act better? Yes. Do I do the things I used to do? For the most part, no. But that doesn't happen 
again, by osmosis, it doesn't happen by accident. You have to discipline yourself. Self-discipline, this idea. That's what, that's what the scripture says, what about, about thoughts, even about thoughts. Take a few thoughts captive, is that what the scripture says? The scripture says to take every thought captive. Let me ask you something. Does that not sound completely exhausting? It's because it is exhausting, and we could never do it on our own. That's the point. I am better now at taking every thought captive than I was six months ago. I will be better six months ago than I am now. That's the point, that upward trajectory of self-discipline, of, of self-control is a part of our growth. Number five, perseverance, 6b, and, and uh, the second part of uh, verse 6, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control self with steadfastness is what this version says. Perseverance is, uh, is another way to say that. Uh, the word literally means to remain under something. So the idea of this word of perseverance, uh, do you have to persevere through the good times? <laughs> no, nobody has ever used the word perseverance when everything is going great in your life. That's a real struggle being this billionaire. Here. You know, nobody does that. It, it's the, the idea of perseverance or steadfastness, the word here in the original language, is to remain under something. And to remain under something in content, context, to remain under something, that's not good. That causes you harm. That causes you discomfort. It causes you pain. That may even cause you suffering. And by being steadfast and persevering, that word carries the connotation that our goal as believers, here's the cool part about this, that our goal as believers is not just to survive it, but to actually thrive through it. That's the point. Perseverance doesn't mean, oh, I just got to wait it out. Hope it gets better. Peter and his friends were thrown into jail for a variety of reasons. I, I've never been to jail. I hope that never happened. I'm counting on it never happening. But I can't imagine it would be a whole lot of fun. And especially back then when they really <laughs> didn't really care about whether or not you were actually hurting people when you were arrested. So, so Peter in, in and his buddies are locked in jail and they're shackled and chained to the floor. And I'm sure they were expecting a lot of yelling and screaming and, hey, get me out of here, and this isn't fair, and so on and so forth. And they did hear a lot of noise coming from that prison cell. Do you remember what it was? It was singing. They weren't just surviving being put in prison. They were persevering while they were there. They were actually thriving through that. Paul talks over and over again about how honored it is to, that we should feel to suffer for Christ, that he thinks enough of us, that he would choose us to suffer in his name. So counterintuitive to us, isn't it? When all we want to do these days is avoid pain at all process. But God gives us, that's part of our growth. Why? Because only when we go through those things are we really going to see and trust God. That's what Job figured out after all those 30 verses of going back and forth with his friends, of asking the same question over and over again. God, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you allow that to happen? I didn't sin. This is, can't be punishment because I didn't do anything wrong. Of which, by the way, he was completely right. He hadn't. God said, I did this to him without cause. Only when we get to the end do we see this great man of God who God bragged on that there was no one like him in the world after he had lost everything and suffered more pain than we could possibly imagine. He says what? I had heard of you by the hearing of my ears, but now I see you. For the first time in his life, he was truly seeing who God actually was because he had persevered through that extremely difficult time. Number six. We'll finish up with these here quickly. Godliness, that is the, that, that's got to be the ultimate goal, right? And knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. To be more like God. That should be our desire. That's why we're growing in the first place. Now, this is amazing passage here. Uh, I hope I wrote it down. I did. 1 Timothy 4, 7, related to this idea. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, 
Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. He starts out by saying, don't listen to the world. Don't listen to them. Does the world value godliness? It does not in any way, shape, or form. Everything that we see, everything that we read, everything that we hear, every song that's out there, every movie we go to, and I'm not saying don't listen to the songs, don't listen to the movies, yes, I understand that, is designed to keep people away from God, to lift us up as individuals. We are the ones who are really gods. We are the ones who decide all that stuff. We talked about all that last week, so we're not going to rehash that again this week. The world doesn't want us to be more like God. When I was in the, in the Navy, we used to do these things every year called PDTC. Don't ask me what it stands for. I have no idea. I never knew the whole time I was in there. I just knew I had to go once a year. So we went there, and this was right after, I don't know if you guys remember, this was years ago. There was a big cheating scandal in the, in the Naval Academy. You guys remember that? A lot of kids got kicked out. It was a pretty, pretty significant organized cheating ring. And if there's one place you do not want to cheat, let me tell you. It's one of the military service academies. They do not smile on that in any way, shape, or form. So what they thought was, okay, well, we need, we need to get people to understand they shouldn't do that. So we need to give them ethics and morals training. So as chaplains, we were gathered together, and the guy comes up there, and he was actually a, a, a professor from the Naval Academy, and he starts talking about all of these things that we could help them do to communicate to the, to the rank-and-file members that you got to, for lack of a better word, do the right thing. They wanted people to treat people the right way. They didn't want them to cheat. They wanted them to tell the truth. They wanted to do all this other stuff. I went up to the guy at, ha at the half, almost at halftime. You can tell what I'm thinking about. I went up to the guy at the break, and, uh, and I, said, uh, I said, look, I understand what you're saying. I really do. I, I know that this is a significant problem because I see it all the time. I said, but there's a really, you've got a really big problem. You want the benefits of Christianity without Christ. The world does like the benefits of Christianity, right? Love your neighbor, forgive, do for others. We get, we, we get read that, that the stuff all the time, right? But they want it without Jesus, and that's impossible. It cannot happen. It is not the world's to give. So that's the point we have got to grasp onto, and we have got to understand, is that our desire should to be, be more like Him, because if we grow in our godliness, there would be no need for those classes, would there? The reason they have to keep doing them over and over again is because the world can't give them a solution to that. Only God can. So we have to grow in our godliness. That is part of who we are. Brotherly kindness, verse 7, and godliness with brotherly affection. Philadelphia. Philos and Adelphos, brotherly love is what that word means in the original language. We've talked about this before. I'm not going I'm not gonna, I'm not to stay here too long because we, I have really hammered this home really since I've been here. We've got to start treating each other like literal family. We've got to stop being glad when, when somebody falls, when some big famous Christian falls into, into sin. We've got to stop joking about it. We've got to stop saying, yeah, you got what was coming to you. We've got to stop doing that. You know, Christianity has long carried the moniker of being the only army in the world that shoots its own wounded. We're really good at that when it should be the exact opposite. I'm not saying support what they did. I'm not saying laud what they did or applaud what they did. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about treating somebody like family. Jesus made it very clear. It's one of the most poignant moments in all of Scripture, and that's saying a lot. When he's standing there talking to his disciples, and they came up and they say, hey, your mom's out there, and your brothers are out there, and your sister's out there, and Jesus points to his disciples and said, you are my family. Now, he, wasn't, he wasn't dismissing them. What he was trying to say is, I am redefining what it means to be a family. Just like I'm redefining everything. Everything you thought you knew about love and forgiveness and salvation, I'm redefining all of that. I'm clarifying all of that. And I am also clarifying what real family is. He said, those people are my family. I have flesh and blood family who are not believers. A stranger on the other side of the world who is a believer is more my family than they are. 
Let that sink in for a second. That's what the scripture says. We've got to start treating each other like that. What happens when we hear about somebody falling? Do we, are we, do we get that little smirk? Do we get that kind of high? I knew it was going to happen. Or do we mourn? Does it break our hearts? It's our family members going through that. Yeah, they may have done something that really harmed themselves. I get that. I understand that. And they are more than getting their just desserts temporarily. But we shouldn't rejoice in that. My goodness, we should love each other and forgive each other and help each other. That brotherly kindness is extremely huge in our growth in Him. Love and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. This is another one we're not going to spend too much time here because I've, I've hammered this home over and over and over again. The scripture is very clear in 1 John. You cannot love if you don't know Christ. You can't. There is not one single unsaved person on this planet who loves somebody else, not as defined by Scripture. Their version of it, their, their idea, the cultural understanding of love, sure. Absolutely. You ever, you ever, you ever seen that the world talks about love all the time, but nobody ever defines it? That's because it means something to everybody else out there. There is no magnetic north for love with the culture. And their love is always only going to go so far. You do, or some, you do say or be something they don't like? You think they're going to love you? They can't love you because it's impossible for them to love you. They cannot love you. Anybody who does not love God cannot love. And so we need to grow in our love for others. Does that mean that we want to spend a lot of time around these people? I never see any of that in Scripture. There are plenty of people I love from a way far off distance. There's nothing wrong with that because love isn't a feeling. Love is a choice, a divine choice. We get to partake in the divine nature is what that passage says. That's part of it. That we can love somebody and still say, eh, yeah, they're not my cup of tea though. I'm, I'm going I'm to stay. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. So growing in our love, growing in our fruitfulness, the single biggest and only, I think, depending on what you define as, as act of destruction, we've talked about this before, the only act of destruction Jesus ever did when he was walking on this planet was cursing a fig tree. Right? He killed, basically, he killed the fig tree. Why did he kill the fig tree? It didn't have any figs on it. But it looked like it should have had figs on it. If you read that passage carefully and understand what they're trying to say, it says they saw the tree from a distance and saw that it was covered in green leaves. Which for a fig tree means when a, you see a fig tree with green leaves, you find figs. They got up to it, there were no figs. And Jesus destroyed it. Now, let me make sure I clarify this. God's not going to kill you if you don't produce enough fruit. That's not what this passage is saying. Because, remember, the tree looked like it should have been producing figs. It wasn't. It wasn't really truly a fig producer. So if you want to compare that, and I know all analogies break down at a certain point. I know that. Jesus even knew that. What he was saying is that, that these are people that aren't saved in the first place. They never were fig trees. But they looked like it. The idea behind that entire event is to say that it is expected for us as believers, to produce fruit. Read Romans 12 for a list of that fruit. Because I know a lot of people thinking, well, you know, I haven't done this, and I've never preached, and I've never taught. And I, you know what some of, the, some of the, the fruit is? Encouragement. There's a, there's a person here that comes to church. I won't say their name because I wouldn't want to embarrass them. The single most encouraging human being I have ever met in my entire life life. I get emails from this person. They'll come up and talk to me. Hey, this is great. And what you said here was really good. And I just want to tell you how this is the best. I, I cannot tell you what that does for me. You have no idea. <laughs> she, and she, she would think she, her eyes would be this big if I mentioned her name. She's like, what? I'm not, I'm just, she's just doing what, what? God comes natural or in her case, supernatural to her. That is the fruit she is bearing. But we are supposed to bear fruit. You don't have to teach an apple tree to bear the fruit. It just comes along with being an apple tree. It's the same with us. We will have fruit 
And that will continue to grow and be a part of our growing process. And lastly, wisdom. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So presupposes, this whole passage presupposes a level of wisdom. A few months ago, I don't know, I've lost track of time, maybe longer than months ago now. We did a whole series of messages through the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you were here for that or not. Solomon has always been one of my favorite folks in all of the scripture. He is really quite the enigma, isn't he? Because David wanted to build the temple, and because of David's sin, God said, no, I'm going to leave it up to your son to do that. And, and, and Solomon was arguably worse than David. So it's really interesting. And he knew that was, that was, going, to, that was going to happen. I mean, he involved in pagan worship and all this, all this other kind of stuff. But one of the things I have always been most intrigued about with Solomon is that when God came, and think about it just for a second, if God came to you right now and offered you this very same deal, he said, ask for anything. Ask for anything on this entire planet, and I will give it to you. What would you do if God made that offer to you? I don't think I would have done what Solomon did. Solomon didn't even hesitate, and he said what? Give me wisdom so that I can treat the people that you've put me in charge of the right way. How cool is that? Give me wisdom. And God was so pleased that he asked, of course he knew, but he was so pleased that he asked for that, he said, now I'm going to give you the other stuff too. Solomon ended up being, in all, for all intents and purposes, the wealthiest person who's ever walked on this planet. One of the most powerful people who's ever walked on this planet. And he made his share of mistakes. There's no doubt about that. But his desire was for wisdom. That's what I want. And not just wisdom. We're not talking about worldly wisdom. We're talking about godly wisdom. Godly wisdom. Fear of the Lord is what the scripture says is the beginning of wisdom. Understanding that it's all based on him. These, that's it. That, these are, he doesn't explain these things. He's just saying these are the elements that you will find in your life. If you are truly growing in Christ, you are going to see these things in some way, shape, or form. And if you're not, then that's a problem. If you're a believer and you're struggling, that's a problem. It could be that you're not a believer at all. That's a huge problem. But the expectation is that we will grow. That's why we do the things we do here at Harmony Community Church, not just here on Sunday morning. The Sunday school, before, before we do that, is to learn God's Word. The small groups to learn God's Word. We're going to do something this summer that's going to help that even a little more. I hope so. And I hope you guys will, will come to those things. I hope you'll see those things. I hope you are in, in, embedded in your Word between now and next Sunday. I want that as much for you as anything else. Because that is the only way we're going to know Him. The only way we are going to grow is in His Word. And that can only start, our growth can only start, if we belong to Him in the first place because of the gospel. That's what it's all about. Every, there are a lot of other places out there, like I said. They do things the way they do them. Here, we are focused on God's Word and the gospel specifically. What is the gospel? Well, let me start off with what it's not. It's not going to church, even though going to church is a good thing. It's not reading the Bible, even though reading the Bible is a good thing. It's not even believing in God, even the demons believe in God, and they're not saved. It is not doing good things. Those things are a part of the gospel in and of themselves. They are not the gospel. What, what is the gospel? To recognize that we are sinners. That is the first and foremost aspect of it because if I think that I'm a really good guy, then I don't need a Savior. Recognize that we are sinners. Know that sin separates us from God. Realize that we owe a debt for that sin, whether we think we do or not. God's the one that holds that note. Accept that this makes us an enemy of God, whether we feel that way or not. Before I was a believer, I would have never characterized myself as an enemy of God, yet that's how He characterized me and died for me anyway. Understand that Jesus paid that debt on the cross and confess and believe. One of the extraordinary things about the gospel is its simplicity. We have overcomplicated it, and it's very easy to overcomplicate it, but it is so simple even a child can understand it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The simplest explanation for the gospel you will ever read is in about five or six verses. 
That's it. It explains the totality of it. And he doesn't save us simply and ultimately so we can go to heaven. That is a huge part of it. It's a great benefit. But he leaves us on this planet after he saves us. And his desire for us is to grow. To know him better than we did before. Every single day of our life. Even if it's just this much more. That's good. That's okay. To know him better than we did before. And that's my prayer here this morning. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord. I praise your name. I lift you on high. and I, Lord, I pray that everything that has been done here has glorified you. Lord, I know that you saved me. I've, of that I have no doubt. I know that you saved me. I also know, Lord, that you want me to grow. You want me to grow. That is the desire that you have for me. Your word is crystal clear on that. And I pray that I do grow in you every single day. But I don't just sit back and wait for it to happen, Lord, that I will do the things that you have given me the ability to do, that you've given me clear instruction to do. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I do, I do those things in order for you to grow me in you. Because I will never truly understand myself apart from understanding you. And so I pray that you have had free reign in this place this morning. You have been lifted up and glorified, and people would be drawn unto you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray.